how do you measure success? And this is a question that I have asked hundreds of times to individuals and as well as to firms that are looking to add value. And quite frankly, it's a question that I truly like to ask police chiefs across the country. And in asking that question, my expectation and the answer would be, would be something around crime rate, it might be around clearance rates, it could, you know, it could be around use of force data. But imagine if you would, that I asked that question, and after I heard the answer back, let's take the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police, for instance, and I said, well, I've been thinking about this a little bit. Perhaps you should be thinking about measuring success like a grocery store. Now, there would probably be a little pause, looking at the watch, clearing of the throat, averting of eyes. You know, this guy has truly lost it. But I'm going to say, think about something. You are the president of a grocery store chain in which you have grocery stores all throughout, the, let's say, the Pittsburgh area. And what you choose to do as part of your value creation, as part of your, part of your strategy, is to have the same items in every single grocery store. Every one would look just like this. You would tout your low prices, your wide aisles, good lighting, cleanliness, easy parking. But your customers would come to you, and what they would say is, well, you know, I'd like to have these different things inside the store. It's not meeting the needs that I have. And when they would come and talk to you, you would say, well, yeah, but we have low prices and we have wide aisles and good lighting. But you weren't meeting the demographics of what was happening in each of the neighborhoods. And therein lies the problem. We're not listening to our customer base. And pretty soon if, within your grocery store, you would start to lose customers to your competitors. The first time I learned the lesson about what this could mean was in the late 90s. I was assigned to be the commander of the Zone 2 precinct in the Hill District. And at the time, the focal point was Center and Kirkpatrick. This is present day Center and Kirkpatrick. Nice bike stand, the library in the background, a bank, you know, typical neighborhood in the city of Pittsburgh. What I will tell you is it was a very different place in the late 90s. In fact, some of you might be very surprised to know that in the late 90s and for a number of years before that, this seemingly serene scene was inhabited and was the largest open-air drug market in the city of Pittsburgh. Three or 400 open-air drug deals would happen across this corner on any given day. And as a police agency, what we were doing was going through and just pure enforcement, arrest after arrest after arrest. And so the community wanted it to look like this, but it was far different, and we were just, and every time they would come up and ask us, we would say, but we're making more arrests. And my first aha moment when doing this was I met, I went into city council. It was a yearly, a yearly piece that we had to do. And as I walked into city council and I sat down, I was the new commander, I did what my predecessors did. I opened my file folder up. They said, how are you doing? And I said, last year at Senator Kirkpatrick, we made X amount of arrests, which is a 10% increase over last year. Sat back. Accolades, please come. Tell me what a great job I'm doing. <laughs> Salu Dean was a city council uh, member at the time. He looked me right across the eye. I can, still, I can still remember this moment. He said, so what? What are you doing to solve the problem? I was crestfallen. Don't you see what I'm doing here? I'm working so hard. I'm making these arrests. But it was a wake-up moment for me. And what we decided to do was work together, and over an 18-month period of time, we changed the way we measured success. I didn't know even what I didn't know then. We closed bars. We put down abandoned houses. We have changed traffic patterns. And the really cool thing was, I won't tell you we solved the drug problem, but all the ancillary crimes that were resolved, the, the homicides, the robberies, the assaults that were happening in this area went away as the open-air drug dealing went away. One of my, whoop, clicking too fast. One of my regrets is that that kind of thinking never held on. Because today, if you ask about a police agency where they measure success, 
they're going to tell you part one crimes. And this is it, folks. When you hear crimes gone up or down, these are the eight crimes that they're talking about. So I want you to think about you, you're in a community meeting beset by violence, by graffiti, drugs, prostitution. You pick what's happening in your community at any given time. You have a police executive come walking in. You have an elected official come walking in. And what they tell you is, is that you start to complain about what the issues are happening. And what you say is, but part one crimes are down 5%. We're back to our grocery store. We're telling you what we think is important. And one of the reasons why we got stuck in this is because my performance evaluations were rated on this, and it still happens to this day. So what do we do about it? Mark Moore is a professor at the Harvard, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. I had the very good fortune of taking a class there, uh, an executive training session several years ago. Mark came upon two very simple and elegant thoughts that I thought were, you know, stuck with me to this day. Number one, a police agency's primary function is not to reduce crime, it's to reduce fear. Think about that and remember that for a minute. The second thing is, Mark was advocating measuring results differently and how communities interacted. And it's been very tough to get traction around this. And I can always see how these two things began to merge together, but I couldn't quite figure out how we wanted to do it. But I want you to think a minute about this whole concept of fear and how it relates to community impact. Because if I show this photo, to individuals, I said, you're walking down the street and you see these four officers approaching you. How are you going to feel? There are going to be some people that say, I heard a couple snickers in the audience. <laughs> some people are going to say, well, I feel safe. I feel good. I know that, you know, for that time being, I'm okay. You're going to have a large majority that say, listen, that makes me fearful. And it's something that police agencies have to recognize that fear of, fear of the police is actually worse than fear of the criminals that are in, there or there. And it's a problem that we have to confront and we have to face. So my eureka moment then starts as I'm asked to put together and I'm asked to work in, with a consulting group with a major city police department. And we started talking about some of these issues. And since... Everything in business can be, any business students here, anything in business can be solved by a two-by-two. Two. We came up with a two-by-two. Two. And this is it. On the x-axis is crime rate from low to high, community satisfaction low to high. And then we put into these quadrants. Best practice, upper left. And what this is, is a community with a low crime rate, high community engagement, they're working together to effectively solve their problems. Lower left, we need to educate and engage. And I'm gonna, I want you to remember this quadrant for a second I'm going to tell you a little bit about a story where this could actually be problematic. You have a low crime rate, but you have low community satisfaction. It's actually truly a danger area because you might have things that are happening underneath in which people aren't feeling, why they're not feeling engaged. Upper right, High community engagement, high crime rate, what a better place to experiment and innovate. You have a group of community members that are looking to work with you to do things. And then finally, high crime, low community engagement. This is a place where trust and fear and where, where you see issues that are beginning that, that happen that people feel unsafe in their communities. Now. Interestingly enough, in this, in this build trust quadrant, I urge you to listen to the news. Because in some of these neighborhoods where you hear this, what do you hear? I've been on the end of that. I've been in the press conferences. I've said we need the community to come forward. We need them to help us. We need them to work with us. I've heard the community members say, we want the police to work with us. They don't understand our problems. 
They just come in and then they leave. It's really interesting. They're both asking for very similar things, but they're not connecting the dots on exactly how to do that. And that creates issues. In the, and in, in, in some people begin to think about, now what do you do here? We have 88 neighborhoods in the city of Pittsburgh. What I would propose is it starts with a quick attitudinal survey in which what we do is we take these 88 neighborhoods, we just plot 1 to 10, 1 to 10, and what we say is we're going to say where each neighborhood plots along that line. Then build a separate strategy in each of those neighborhoods. We're back to our grocery store, folks. This is why grocery stores use loyalty cards. They want you to come back. They want you to be the voice of the customer. And what happens is, is that then we arm our officers with communication strategies when they're in those neighborhoods, exactly what to be talking about because these are the concerns that are happening within each of the groups. At the same time, we have to, every three months, readapt what we're doing because people are going to move through here. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that our measure of success doesn't become this crime rate piece. What our measure of success becomes is how are we moving through this and moving people out of the red zone? How do we move people purple to green? How, what is our success in moving people into areas in which we see the type of thing that we want to happen? We're not attacking the crime rate. We're not at Center and Kirkpatrick just making arrests and hoping for the best. What we're doing now is measuring success in a different way where the crime rate becomes the outcome, not the focal point. And it's a very different way of looking at law enforcement. In the late, in the late 80s into the early 90s, the New York, New York City was beset by crime. And Comstat was created. And Comstat was basically a system in which you would look at clusters of crime and you would attack that crime. And historically now, Comstat, which was seen as, as, as groundbreaking, we used it in the city of Pittsburgh, and police agencies across the country used it. But Comstat was interesting because as fear began to decrease in New York City, and even though crime went down, what happened was the effort got stalled in this lower left-hand quadrant. You can make that argument. Because what happened was the community began to question the methods that the NYPD was using in order to reduce crime. They didn't feel engaged. And what I'm suggesting to you is, is that there's a way for the community to be engaged first in order to reduce crime. None of this is easy. You know, obviously, this is where we want to get. But it's going to take all of you. It's going to take enlightened elected officials. It's going to take enlightened police executives, officers willing to do communication strategy, communications experts, data analytics. But all of these are bold moves. But bold moves are what required to change the present day. Think about something. When you think about police community relations, are you satisfied with what you're seeing? Are these things, you know, these types of images too rare? And I think a lot of you could look about it and maybe say, yeah, I think maybe they are. In business, these aren't new concepts. Be it a grocery store, be it a manufacturing environment, whatever the case may be. We've already understood. You listen to the customer. You build brand loyalty. Brand loyalty then besets people wanting to work with you. You add value and you move forward. We teach it. We do it. That's what works well. So this isn't a new concept, but it is a new concept in public safety. What I'd like you to do is think about, don't we really owe this to our communities? To be innovative, to be transparent, to engage, to think about ways in which the police agencies aren't telling the citizens what they're doing and asking them to sort of be grateful for the work but also working in partnerships so you can look together and so we have safer communities and better standards of living across whatever neighborhood that you're living in. Thank you very much.